Good evening, and welcome to What's Your Story? President Harry Truman is quoted as having remarked, the only thing new in the world is the history that you don't know. If you love history, this show is for you. There are many great repositories of history in the United States, but did you know that right here in Connecticut is one of the best? The Connecticut Historical Society has been preserving Connecticut's history for nearly 200 years. My guest tonight, Eileen Frank, will help bring that history to life. Welcome to the show, Eileen. This is part two of your interview. It's great. Terrific. <laughs> Why was it named the Connecticut Historical Society? I couldn't find any, and when I was researching, I couldn't find any real specific reason, but histor there, had, there were other historical societies in the nation. Um, I think it conveyed a sense of a group coming together, society, sort of a, a club type feel to it. Historical, that's what we were focused on, and then just they wanted it to be, they knew they wanted it to be statewide, so we'll just go with the entire state name. So. How long did it be? How long did it take before it actually became statewide? So I know the intent from the beginning yeah, was that, but yeah. that happened right away. It, it happened really early on, honestly. Um, so from the beginning, the intent was to be statewide. Um, the individuals who founded the organization, it was not completely 50-50, but it was close 50-50, Hartford 50% 50 from the rest of the state. Um, and definitely by the 1840s when um, Henry Bernard is um, involved with us. He really actively tried to make sure that there was um, both collecting from across the state and representation in the membership from across the state. So um, although we've always been housed in Hartford and while the collection um, does have a lot from the, I would say the greater Hartford area, we've also always had stuff from Litchfield County and New London County and um, Fairfield County. It's always been part of the collection. Okay. Over the years, the Society has had many great exhibits. Can you share with us five that are particularly memorable? So I was not uh, on staff when the exhibit was, was done, but the Amistad exhibit is one that people um, talk about a lot and uh, was up for a long period of time. And so this was a, a large exhibit that the Connecticut Historical Society did. I think it opened, I want to say it opened like 99 or 2000. Um, it was right around the time that the movie had, had, uh, had come out, um, and it really talked about, I mean, it's, it's such an incredible story. The, the, um, the Africans who, uh, who try to get their freedom and, and, and yeah. yeah, and, um, the role that Connecticut and the individuals involved in, you know, in getting it to go all the way to the Supreme Court for the case to be decided. So that was a that was a very popular. Wasn't exhibit. the trial in downtown Hartford at the old state house? So the trial was both when it was in Connecticut. Yeah. There were times when it was at the what we call the old state house yeah. in downtown Hartford. Of course, to them it was just the state house. Yes. Um, yeah. And also there were um, case case was heard also in New Haven because this okay. was still when the capital was All moving right. back yes. and forth, okay. back and forth. Yep. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a real Connecticut story. So that exhibit was definitely uh, a big hit. Um, now, what do you know? Do you are you able to track your numbers and tell who comes in by culture? We we depending on the period of time at the historical society, we do different demographic tracking. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, that one was definitely well attended. I don't know if we okay, have right. statistics on any other kind of sort of makeup. Other so we got numbers. the Amistad was one. What yes. else? Um, again, this was one. I'll do two. I'll do two before I arrive, and then I'll do three. All right. Okay, All right. that'll work. So um, the other one that was a very popular show was we took in a traveling exhibition of Catherine Hepburn's clothing, um, and what, Hollywood clothing or just her everyday clothing. Both. So it was stuff she wore on various sets, and then also some of her personal clothing. Um, so uh, that was she. If we do anything, Catherine Hepburn. Um, we get attendance. People still love her and feel connected to her. There are still people who n knew her family or have stories of running into her. I mean, she, although she has been gone for a number of years now, uh, there's still a lot of personal connection. So that was a very well attended Didn't she show. reside in Connecticut? She did. She had um, a house along the shore um, near Saybrook. So I believe she's buried on Fairfield Avenue in the cemetery over there. Cedar Grove. Yeah, Cedar right. Grove, yes. Yep. She's buried in Cedar Grove, and, um, you know, her family 
her whole family is actually really interesting. Her mom was a very strong suffragette. Um, no. And, and was uh, also involved in um, some of the early uh, sort of uh, issues around birth control access for women. So they were they were a pretty fascinating family. And then and then Catherine has this amazing Hollywood career. So. Yeah, she did. Yeah. yeah, absolutely did. She did. Kate. Kate. Absolutely. Okay, so. The, the clothing of Katherine Hepburn. Yes. How long was that exhibit there? Do you know? Um, I want to say it was about six months that it was on view. So now how did you get her clothing? How did you do that? So, so it was a traveling exhibit. The m most of her clothing is at a university in Ohio, and they put together um, this exhibit. And then there's a whole system out there for if you want to rent traveling shows and. Since we knew we had some stuff in our collection, we do have some items related to Katherine Hepburn. We have golf clubs, we have a tennis racket, we have a tennis outfit. We recently acquired four of her straw hats. She was famous for wearing these straw hats to protect her from the sun. Um, so we knew that that would be an, an exciting exhibit to both borrow this collection and have the exhibition and then add to it with stuff from our collection. That's what, two? That was two. All right. Um, one that I am very proud of is we did an exhibit celebrating the 200th anniversary of the American School for the Deaf. Um, and so that was a really great exhibit. We were in, in production for about two years before we installed it, um, really working closely with uh, faculty at um, ASD and their students and alumni um, and working with a lot of historians on deaf culture and um, to to raise up someone else's history and, and culture and to do it in a way that they really appreciated and respected it um, was important for us. And, and, and the Historical Society, um, we do not have any staff who are deaf or hard of hearing, but we um, did a lot of work to make sure that we were um, trained in sensitivity and we even took some ASL classes and um, it, was a, it was a great, exhibit and again a part of history that I think most people they might know the school they might see it it's currently in West Hartford they might drive by but to know how that it was the first permanently established school for the deaf in the nation and that that happened here in Connecticut was a, a really important story for us to tell yeah I have a, a personal uh, connection to ASD my daughter was born deaf and she attended ASD so I had an opportunity to get to learn about the school and its dedicated staff and, and people who were there. It's a, it's a really a magnificent school. Yeah. And I felt lucky living in Connecticut that such an institution was in fact in Connecticut for my daughter to go to. What people may not realize is that people come from all over the world to attend ASD. Absolutely. You know, people don't even realize that, how important that school really is. And if you go down Asylum Street, you'll see Alice Cogswell in a pair the of statue, hands. Yes. Yeah, and that's the symbol of Miss Cogswell, who was deaf, which started the whole uh, movement actually to get uh, sign language, ASL, Thomas Gallaudet, and all of that, and which resulted, of course, in that magnificent school. So, yeah, yeah if you get a chance, <laughs> I want to just do a shout out to ASD. Thank you for everything you did for my daughter and so many, many, many other people. And, Godspeed in the future, ASD. So that must have been a magnificent exhibit. I'm sorry I missed that one. Yeah. All right, that's three. That's what do we three. got? So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to go from, from a really powerful exhibit uh, to one that was really fun. We did an exhibit called That's Weird. Um, and it was a lighthearted take on looking at our collection. So we say that if you were to count every photograph, every pair of sock, every painting, every yes. piece of paper, we have over four million objects in our collection. There's no way we can ever display them all. And this exhibit allowed us to bring out some of the oddities that we have that might not fit into another exhibit, but let's let's show them, um, give them some attention. All right, what were some of the oddities? So we, we had sections on, like, why did they collect that? So, you know, why do we have things associated with the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, which did not take place in Connecticut, took place in, in Washington, D.C., but at the time, the people in Connecticut knew that it was such an important American event that they wanted to bring back mementos and souvenirs from that. So we, we highlighted some of that collection. We had a section on death and dying because um, in the Victorian era, they had a really different approach to mourning. Um, it was very public. 
um, thing, making things like jewelry out of a loved one's hair, whether that loved one was departed or not, was a, was a very popular pastime. And so we have a collection of hair jewelry. Your face is wonderful right now. Um, <laughs> I find it fascinating and think it's amazing. There are people who are grossed out at the idea that someone would wear a bracelet made out of someone's hair. Well, wasn't it like lockets with hair in it? Yep, All lockets, that kind of stuff back yep, then. Yeah. Earrings, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. We had... Um, Artwork that uh, we either don't really know how, why we collected it. We had some grotesque caricatures that we're not even really sure, like what they were supposed to be. Um, so we had we had that stuff on display, okay, yeah. um, and we had some stuff around around some of Connecticut's legends and, and myths. So we had um, the Leatherman. I don't know if you know his story, but he's a he's a, a famous. Uh, he was a man who did this uh, route through. Um, Eastern New York and Western Connecticut, and he would do the same circle, and he walked, and he didn't really talk to anyone, and he was he always wore this leather outfit, and so we have the leather outfit that he wore. So we we kind of did oddities like that. Okay. All so right. that was a really fun All right. fun exhibit. All right, yeah. Um, and then we did a great exhibit just recently on World War One that I was really proud of the way that we handled that. We. Um, focused on Connecticut's role in response to World War I, and we used the power of personal narrative to make that war, which is um, can feel so distant, to make it come a little bit more alive. So we found some really interesting stories. Um, we found a story of a conscientious objector um, who was in Connecticut and got arrested and served in time in a federal prison for refusing to be uh, drafted into the war. Um, we, the story of, of William Bell, who becomes the first president of the um, Hartford branch of the NAACP and his service record during World War I. Um, some stories of some nurses who served, a woman who went after the war was over but did a lot of relief work because France and Belgium were still so devastated. So I was really proud of how we raised the profile of some, some individuals to make a connection to that, to that time period. Is that five or is that four? I think that's four, so I'll be really fast with five. No, 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 you don't have to be fast. All I'll, right. I'll be five, yeah. So five is one that we just did now, um, and uh, it's uh, it's important to me. We, we, we worked with students uh, from Central Connecticut State University and Professor William Mann, um, and the students were enrolled in a class that was looking at um, digging through the archive to find stories of gays and lesbians and bisexuals and transgender people, you know, the queer community. And how do you, again, how do people who sometimes didn't make it into the record get entered into the record and yes, where are those stories? Yes, yes. So from their research and working with them, we have um, developed a, a traveling exhibit. It's eight pop-up banners that tell the history, LGBTQ history in Connecticut. Uh, really try to focus specifically on Connecticut history, not national stories. Um, and that exhibit is currently on view at CCSU. It will be coming to CHS. Um, this summer, and then we have other plans to travel it around the state. And uh, I'm I'm really proud of that work. It, we are. Um, it's a small exhibit because it's just you know these pop-up banners because we wanted it to be portable so it could go to lots of places and Absolutely, be seen. Yes, yes. Um, but that also means it can't capture every single story. Sure. So we're building a digital timeline where we can add more stories, and even members of the public will eventually be able to add stories to this digital timeline um, that can that can create an archive of this history. You know, people often ask, who's the most famous Californian? Who's the most famous Michigander and so forth? Do you know who the most famous gay person is from Connecticut? Oh, goodness. That's a really good question that I didn't think of asking, but I just got that out of me right now. This interview is so great. That's what brought that to the fore. Uh, you you stumped better go back me. and research you've that. I'm, I am. Yeah. You've stumped me. Yeah. You've stumped me. I, I didn't intend to do that. That's okay. You know? but I, it just occurred to me, you know, that... Why would there be one? I yeah, mean, absolutely. Absolutely, there'd be there'd be the most famous African American, and sure. So forth, most famous woman. Yeah. So why wouldn't there be a most famous gay person from Connecticut? Well, and I think it's what are you looking at? You know, there's some of the early politicians who came out. Maybe they're famous because they they were in political roles, or maybe there's people who had fame in in entertainment. I. I'd have to double check that okay. one. Okay, all right. I'll get back to you. You'll get back to me on that one. Oh. Have, me, have me on again. <laughs> Speaking of famous people, who's some of the famous people who visited the Connecticut Historical Society? 
Do you uh, know any of them? Yeah, so um, uh, Paul Newman, we know that he came uh, when he was alive, and his wife, uh, Joanne Woodward. Uh, really? They, they, were, they were even members for a while, so we know they visited. Um, we know lots of different governors have made their way through our halls. Do you have pictures of Mr. Newman and his wife's visit? You know, we don't. What? I know, I know. Weren't there I think cameras? What's going there on There were here? cameras, but I think it was the in the time period before the selfie with your you know, cell phone. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Uh, it would, might have been a little more obvious yeah, with uh, okay. a big camera set up. Okay. Um, but a lot of politicians have been through, a lot of uh, industry leaders, but uh, I love the fact that Paul Newman was at the Historical Society. Yeah, he's quite, his family, he and his family, quite something with the Connecticut, the the club for the kids. Uh, yeah, they, yeah. They do uh, all of the proceeds from his uh, hole, staff. Hole in the wall. Right. Yeah. All of the proceeds go to help kids. You know. Yeah. It, it's amazing it, the stories you don't know. President Truman is right. You know, you just don't know so much about people. You know, you look at you think of Paul Newman. I, I automatically think of Cool Hand Luke. Sure. But, but there was so much to the man himself. You know. Very philanthropic. And his wife, absolutely, that very philanthropic. Um, The mission of the Connecticut Historical Society. What is it today, and is it the same as it was in the 1800s? So today our mission is connecting you and the story of Connecticut. And I love it as a mission because it's about making connections. It's not about just, I'm going to present a bunch of facts and drop them and you do whatever you want. But what does that take for us to actually make a connection to history? How do we really engage the public with this? And that requires us to be innovative in our programming. It requires us to present a multiplicity of stories and narratives so that people can see themselves in the history that we're presenting. So I really love our mission that we have. Um, it is, uh, in spirit, I think it's similar to what they had in 1825. But 1825 was much more about uh, we will collect and share the civil, ecclesiastical, and natural history of the state and the nation. Uh, it, it, was, it was very lofty and, and, uh, um, and also broader. I mean, they were collecting American history, not just Connecticut history. So, but that spirit of we're collecting it so that people can be inspired by it, um, that's the thread that links us to the past. Now, there are three major galleries at the uh, Connecticut Historical Society. Would you please tell us about each one? Yes. Yeah, so um, on the second floor um, of our museum, which is also handicap accessible, um, we have two galleries. One is our large gallery. It's what we call our, our permanent gallery. The exhibit has been on display for a number of years, and um, is, there's no plans to take it down anytime soon. Um, the, the exhibit in there is called Making Connecticut. And it's um, an overview of uh, about 500 years of history. So really starting at um, contact period when um, Europeans were first coming over and, and you know, cut that contact with the, the native tribes that were here, um, going up to the present day. Now, I laugh because when the exhibit was designed 10 years ago, uh, we, we already have 10 years of history that's not really represented. We do our best to, to yep. freshen up that sort of last Absolutely. case and keep Absolutely. bringing in the present day. Yep. Um, but, you know, history is always always being created. Um, but it's a really great uh, overview. It, it's a great um, exhibit to show the range of stuff we have in our collection, everything from tall case clocks and needleworks to uh, rotary phones and microwaves that some of us don't want to think about are in museums, but they are. Um, then also upstairs we have a gallery that we change about every two, two to three times a, a year. We change that. Um, currently we have a really powerful exhibit called Black Citizenship in the Age of Jim Crow, which is a traveling exhibit that was first organized by the New York Historical Society. Now it's going to be traveling across the nation. We're the first stop since it left New York. And what we did at our location is we've added in um, objects from the collection that talk about the, that period, so right after the Civil War and during the time of Reconstruction through up until about World War I. So we've added letters and documents and objects um, that are black history in Connecticut. Um, so that exhibit is on view until September 14th. And then downstairs we have a, a gallery on our first floor. We change that usually like four to six times a year. So those, those exhibits are only on view for maybe about two, maybe three months. Um, we currently have a show that uh, it's a new acquisition show for us. So it's 
new objects that have come into the collection in the past five years. So it's very eclectic. Um, there's some dresses, there's paintings. It's just to kind of get, a, again, like what we think is interesting to collect now. Um, and then uh, when that exhibit closes in, in uh, shortly, just a few more weeks, okay. um, on May 20th, we'll be opening up an exhibit that we did in partnership with the Hartford Symphony Orchestra. They're celebrating their 75th season, and we did Whoa. an exhibit to highlight that. Right, yeah. So um, there's always something new every every time you come, and it's great to visit our exhibits. Do you have plans for your what? It's your 200th anniversary coming up. 2025, we'll be celebrating 200 years of the Connecticut Historical Society, and we are definitely uh, starting to. Ha it is never too early to plan. So we have conversations about. Will we be redoing that large exhibit I mentioned? Yes, what yes. kind of celebrations and commemorations will we have? Um, the last time a history was a history was written about CHS was for our 175th, so that published history probably needs to be updated. So we're starting to talk about what we'll do in 2025. Now, over the years, the Connecticut Historical Society has striven to become more uh, inclusive itself. In, in its hiring practices and in its board composition. The board is qu uh, quite multicultural now, as I understand it. Yeah. But I understand that there's still the old bugaboo that it's a, a white organization for white people. How do, you, how, how do you attack that? What do you do? I think for us, it's that we are always um, trying to engage the community. So if, if I sit here as, as a, a white woman with my background and tell the community this is what they want to see, that's, gonna, that's not going to be so great. I, I can't know what everyone in our, and all the diverse communities that make up our state, I don't know what it, stories are interesting. So we really try to engage the community um, and find out what histories they want to learn, what stories they want to tell. Um, partnerships are huge for us. Um, so doing work um, with community groups and civic groups, uh, three years ago, we adopted the State Folk Life Program, the Connecticut Cultural Heritage Arts Program, and that has been really amazing in um, celebrating thing, or communities such as, you know, there's a large Tibetan community near Old Saybrook. There's a large Mexican community based th in Wallingford. There's a large Finnish community that's been around since the, around World War I out in eastern Connecticut. Um, so working with these populations and these communities to raise up their cultural arts keep those traditions alive, to listen to their tradition bearers and then raise them up. Those are all ways that we're working to uh, make sure that there's diversity in what we do. Let's talk about nuts and bolts. There is parking there, right? There's lots of parking. There's lots of parking yeah. for, for people who want to come. Free parking. Free parking for people to come. And you did say it's handicap accessible. Yes, and, yes. And, uh, wheelchairs. Yes, okay. we have elevators to the second floor, so yes. And, and if you need other accommodations, um, if you are coming to a program and you would like it to be ASL interpreted, we just need a few weeks notice to get that. Oh, so you can, you can actually provide that. And we okay. provide that as well. So yes. you, do you, you provide meeting space for different community groups as well? Sometimes we do, yeah. It depends on the different rentals. We've done larger rentals in the past, sometimes not so much. Um, usually, if it's a group that we're working with, we're, we can do more of that community uh, meeting space. Now, you've obviously come here and been a terrific guest today. Do you go to other places or do other people go out and talk about the Connecticut Historical Society? Yeah, we have a whole um, adult outreach program that we bring to libraries and senior centers. Every year we have about six different topics, um, really popular ones, Catherine Hepburn. Uh, yes, uh, yes. We have one that's all about wedding traditions and we have one, um, especially that's popular in October, about witches, the history of witches in Connecticut. Uh, okay. But we also will be happy to come and talk about just CHS in general if you're right. interested. Terrific, terrific. That's all the time we have for tonight's show. My thanks to my guest, Eileen Frank. Everybody has a story. What's yours? Thank you for tuning in. Until next time, good night. <laughs>